We, um, I, as I mentioned early, you know, I showed you some slides about center doing about research and to advance the science for both cures, but also supportive and survivorship work. Um, but it's really the work from talking to all of you as patients and caregivers that one motivates us to keep doing better, um, but also to advance the science. And so thank you to all of you, whether you're sharing it in a big audience um, or in a one-on-one -on -one environment, um, we really appreciate it. Um, I am delighted to introduce our morning keynote presenter. Um, this is a colleague and a friend of mine, Dr. Heather thompson -Bum. Um, As a primary care physician in her mid forties, Dr. Thompson was diagnosed with breast cancer. She faced multiple medical decisions, this time though about her own health. She might've sat in the role of being a provider, um, but all of a sudden the tables turned and this was her dealing with this. Her presentation will illustrate how a doctor as both an informed medical professional and human being copes with a new cancer diagnosis. Dr. Thompson fell back on what sustained her previously, such as music, faith, exercise. But along the way, she discovered new coping mechanisms such as humor and writing and sharing her story. The experience also informed her future approach to patient care in unexpected and unanticipated ways. And what initially seemed like a negative life event became a process of growth and transformation. As a survivor, Dr. Thompson shares insights into how one sustains health going forward, both physical and mental, and how to make our interactions with the healthcare system more effective. We're thrilled to have Heather here today and I'll let her take it away. Well, thank you for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak today. It's a real honor and a privilege. Um, can everybody hear me? I know the microphone. I'm going to use this podium microphone um, and the, uh, so I can kind of see what my slides are doing. It's a little hard, you know, when you, when you have the, the screens to your left and to your right. Um, so my name is, my patients still talk, call me Dr. Thompson. I got married after I started on faculty and Bume is kind of hard to pronounce. It's Norwegian. There's two U's. Nobody know what's, knows what to do with two U's. Sometimes I say it's like vacuum. That's about the only other word I can think of that has two U's with a similar pronunciation. Um, but um, I wanted to again uh, say welcome to everyone and thank you for the invitation to speak. So um, a little bit about me, um, the next slide will show my bio actually from the U of M website. And um, I joined the faculty in 2002 and um, I've been in practice for, that's over 20 years now, I realize that's a long time. And uh, initially I, I'm in general internal medicine. Initially I practiced both outpatient and inpatient medicine, meaning I, I did some hospital rounds um, week, a few weeks out of the year. Uh, also had primary care outpatient clinic. I gradually sunsetted my inpatient practice. My last rounds were in 2020 uh, during all the fun. Um, and now I devote all my time to uh, practicing outpatient primary care. But I also have a number of teaching and administrative roles. So about half my time, I'm working with medical students and residents um, and uh, participating in leadership roles as well. But for me, everything changed in 2016. I was 44 at the time, and I hadn't haven't, had not even had a screening mammogram yet. So the guidelines at the time were kind of, uh, you can either start at age 40 or start at age 50. And I'm like, I'm gonna split the difference. I'm gonna, I'll say 45. <laughs> and wouldn't you know it, at age 44, um, I found a lump myself at home. And of course, I kind of put it off for a couple of days. I waited thinking, oh, it's just a fluid filled cyst. It, it'll go away. Uh, but when it didn't, I called the clinic. I was set up with a mammogram and an ultrasound that actually showed uh, two suspicious areas in my right breast. Um, the biopsy was positive, one for lobular carcinoma and the other for invasive ductal carcinoma. And as anyone in this room can relate, it, the first few weeks following a cancer diagnosis is probably the worst, right? The, the most stress. Um, it's really hard to know what's gonna happen next when you don't have a firm diagnosis or an established treatment plan as of yet. And I'm not sure that being a physician made that any better for me. In fact, it might've been worse because my physician brain had the tendency to overinterpret every test result, such as 
my primary MD ordered a breast MRI after this ultrasound finding, and it showed a tiny ditzel on the left that ended up to be nothing. But of course, um, my physician brain would assume the worst. And as a primary care doctor that had a large patient panel of female patients, I followed a lot of breast cancer survivors in my own clinic. And while many of them did well, a lot of them had complications from their treatment. Some of them had recurrence many years out. And so I couldn't help but reflect back on that as I considered my own health situation. And in that first few weeks, in that short period of time, there's an incredible amount of medical decision-making that has to go on in a short period of time and under intense stress and anxiety. And the first question is usually about surgery. And obviously the type of surgery you have is an entirely personal decision. It's, it is informed by uh, medical outcomes and so on. But um, I was struck by how often assumptions were made um, by some doctors and some friends and family members that I would automatically want um, bilateral mastectomy with immediate reconstruction. That was just kind of an assumption that was made. And I actually had to do a little bit of reading and literature search on my own to realize there's more than that option. Um, how do I tell my children? Breaking the news to them really weighed on my mind. They were eight and 11 at the time. And I didn't want to increase their anxiety um, unnecessarily, but I wanted them to be uh, in on what was going on. And so it was interesting that I actually fell back on a technique that I was taught in medical school on how to break bad news to a patient. It's a five-step model. And I used the exact same five steps with my children and was surprised to find out that it worked pretty well. I actually wrote a paper on that and I can share more of that um, if you're interested. So I was 44 at the time. That's not that young, but not that old. So genetic testing was recommended. And of course that takes weeks to come back. And the results of that really strongly influenced the surgical decision-making, right? Um, so that was a period of intense waiting uh, as well as wondering, wondering about the implications for my children. And then at the time I was a full-time physician with two young kids and I kept thinking, what about chemo and radiation and potential side effects? Am I gonna be able to function? How am I gonna be able to carry on? And honestly, these million dollar questions, if you will, they never really go away. Um, uh, later on, oops, okay. Sorry about that. Okay, so advancing the slide. Uh, you know, at my one year follow up and even every follow up beyond that, there is um, all kinds of million dollar questions. They might not be as weighty, but they're certainly as numerous as time goes on. Um, the, there's always scanxiety, right? The anxiety associated with every follow-up scan, uh, waiting for the test results. So it never really ends, you know, being a, a cancer survivor, no matter what your course is or what your outcome is, it's part of you forever. And I had a breast cancer survivor patient of mine just tell me that yesterday when I So given everything that you can see on this slide, I had fairly good outcomes. I had a, a rapid recovery. Um, I chose right simple mastectomy, no recon. So I was back to work in two weeks. I was back to running um, in four weeks. I had really no problems taking tamoxifen after the hot flashes subsided. That took about three months, but um, I continued to take it. So I felt truly blessed and I was really grateful for my outcomes and my care team but I'd always feel a bit more guilt, especially when I would hear about women younger than me, even with more aggressive disease. And it's tough not to make comparisons. And it's also hard when you're speaking to survivor groups, for example, um, I would almost feel a twinge of, you know, how much do I share about this if my outcomes are better than uh, so many in the room? So given the situation, I fell back on a few coping mechanisms um, that helped me cope with the stress. Some of them were very familiar to me, others were brand new. I'll be talking a little bit more about writing and also humor in the next several slides. But first, I've been talking at you guys for a little while. I'm going to do an audience poll. I don't have any fancy polling software or an app, but a raise a hand seems to work just fine, right? So um, how many of you engage in the creative writing process at all? 
Have you uh, had journaling, poems, short stories, et cetera? It's a pretty good number, good. How many of you have written about your own personal health issue? That's kind of a similar number, yes, great. How many have published creative writing pieces? Uh, magazines, local, great. That's great, congratulations. So, um, so we're not alone in this, right? We, we're finding that there is writing as a coping mechanism is, is um, definitely an effective maneuver. And I'm actually gonna share some briefly some medical literature supporting this. So if you do a lit search, there are actually many scientific studies pretty much in the last three decades um, that talk about the, uh, the therapeutic aspects of creative writing and validating this approach. Here's two recent examples. These studies involved about 70 patients each, showed that journaling reduced anxiety and expressive writing reduced psychiatric symptoms in first-time cancer diagnosis patients. However, some of the larger studies, which we call some of the larger studies that were we call um, systematic reviews, you know, they pool together data from a number of studies. Some of those studies ended up being sort of equivocal, meaning no detectable differences in self-reported physical or psychological outcomes. But the authors did note that certain groups did demonstrate benefit, patients writing about their own cancer diagnosis and patients with a relative lack of social support. And the authors also conclude that Given that therapeutic writing is easy to implement, it's low cost, it's certainly no harm to the patient that we should still be encouraging this approach. Now I'm gonna shift gears a tiny bit and discuss how my book came about as, as a, an example of therapeutic writing and narrative medicine and how that can be put to use. So I have to give credit to my friend, Amanda. So that's me and Amanda on a boat ride on Wiper Lake. And he basically was riding in the car with me one day. I think we were driving to church together and we carpooled with uh, dropping off our kids. And she said, I was telling her story after story about what was happening in terms of this cancer diagnosis because so much happened so rapidly in those first few weeks. And she said, you know, you really should be writing this down, especially later on down the road, you, you might not be able to remember everything that has happened. And I thought, well, that's a great idea. I guess I'll start doing that. Rather than using pen and paper, I decided to use Google Docs, which is kind of a handy way of, of writing because um, it's very easy to write on the fly, um, write on a tablet device or even a phone um, and stay connected. So as I wrote, I began to see some different benefits that came about. First of all, as a, for my own physical and mental health, I was, as these quotes illustrate, um, I began to think that writing was my personal way of breaking bad news to myself. Getting thoughts, fears, emotions, observations out of my brain and onto paper was extremely therapeutic. It was also moving me in the direction where I could get past the anxiety and pause, reflect, learn from, and therefore be changed by my experience as a patient. And as I continued to write, I began to think that maybe others would benefit from reading this, other breast cancer survivors, other healthcare providers who are in the process of guiding patients on this journey. Um, I began to think that it could have a wider audience with, with all the benefit wanting to just help others in similar situations. Now, as I continued to write, I began to, the story began to expand uh, much beyond just my medical situation or my cancer diagnosis or what was happening to me. And I started to write more about my patients. My patients from even years ago began to work, work themselves into my writing. Um, anything that came out in a publication, I always asked my patient permission um, to mention the story. Usually I would change a name or an identifier, but 100% of the patients I asked to include in my writing said yes. I think they were honored and, and wanted to be a part of something bigger. So writing about patients for me, became a way to honor them and remember them and help me to process the tough stuff. So there's a, a whole, I could do a, another entire talk on the idea of narrative medicine. So physicians and nurses and other healthcare providers are experiencing a lot of burnout. That was even pre-pandemic and it's made worse since then. And one way to mitigate burnout is to write, to, to write about stories where maybe you had an outcome that you really weren't anticipating with your patient 
or maybe you had to process something really hard that happened to you um, on the wards or in clinic. So therapeutic and narrative medicine is another way of uh, mitigating burnout amongst our healthcare workers. I also wrote a lot about colleagues and mentors, people who came alongside me, not just during the cancer journey, but before and after in terms of professional growth and development. And so writing about them actually helped me um, uh, get ideas and inspiration for becoming a better mentor myself. Because at the University of Minnesota, I have students and residents working with me almost all the time and many opportunities to mentor in that way. And then writing about primary care and academic medicine is a way of reminding us why we went into the profession in the first place, right? So recapturing that joy in medicine, that's a very common theme right now as we emerge from the pandemic, is how do we capture or recapture the joy in medicine? So given all of this, and, and as the writing began to accumulate, I had a new idea. I began to submit these as essays or creative writing pieces to academic journals. Why? That's the only kind of writing that I had published prior <laughs> to my cancer diagnosis. I had been a part of a couple of research uh, studies. I had written up a couple of educational innovations that got published in medical education journals. But I was surprised at the number of creative writing outlets there are in academic medical journals. This one on the right is an example. Um, the Journal of Clinical Oncology has a section called Art of Oncology, and I submitted an article that described me breaking bad news to my kids and using the five-step method that I was taught in medical school. And it was published as Out of the Mouths of Babes, a physician discusses her cancer diagnosis with her two young children. Uh, and the benefit of getting that out there in the literature is um, I've actually gotten emails from oncologists like halfway across the globe that said that they printed out this article and gave it to their patient who was struggling with how to tell their kids. So that's an amazing thing. And that was kind of my way of giving back. Oops. So gradually, um, as the writing kind of accumulated, um, I had amassed enough material for a book and um, it took a while to find a publisher, a traditional publisher, but um, I found Joshua Tree Publishing in, out of, based in Chicago. Uh, and the books, the books were published in 2019. Book number one is called Mirth is God's Medicine, Coping with Cancer as a Physician. And book number two, With Mirth and Laughter. Now, um, a lot of people ask me, well, which one should I read? Or which, what are these books about? How are they different? Book one is sort of like doctor as patient, what that's like to enter the medical uh, world for the first time as a patient. And then book two is more what happens next. So patient as doctor. So how does becoming a patient change my practice style, my approach, what it means to provide patient-centered care, and even how it starts to change my interactions with students and residents um, in teachable moments. And you can see that um, within the titles, there's some overlap in the themes of this conference, which is so great, right? Humor and laughter is our next keynote speaker in the afternoon. Um, so you notice that mirth is in both titles. Um, I tried to incorporate, incorporate a lot of humor in my writing. I found there's a little bit of dark humor, a little bit of irony a lot of times in what we're going through as a patient. Um, I also found that sharing a humorous approach or a more light, um, handling it with a lighter touch meant that the material wasn't so dark and deep and depressing and, and people could read this and find that there's still um, humor and joy in those moments uh, in between the difficult times as well. And this quote I found from Henry Ward Beecher sums it up nicely. Mirth is God's medicine. Everyone ought to bathe in it. Grim care, moroseness, anxiety, all the rest of life ought to be scoured off with the oil of mirth. So Henry Ward Beecher was a Presbyterian minister, a prolific author, and the sibling of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. So very uh, literary family, obviously. Now, as a funny aside, when I was desperately searching for a book title, something that hadn't, hadn't already been taken, I came across this mirth uh, quote, and uh, my family was like, oh, that's a terrible title, like mirth. Nobody knows what mirth is. It sounds like a Shakespearean term. And very, I said, well, but I stuck with it. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that it's it's been a nice uh, segue to, to tie the two books together. So as we're talking about humor, a lot of this is going to overlap with the afternoon session. Um, we do see humor benefiting both physical and mental health. Um, you can look across the medical literature and find that 
humor decreases stress hormones such as epinephrine and cortisol, boosts immunity via our cell activity, uh, reduce rates of cardiac complications in patients recovering from uh, cardiac arrest or an MI. That's pretty amazing. Anti-inflammatory effects improve glycemic control, improved or increased pain tolerance. So there are definitely physiologic effects and health benefits to incorporating humor. And this humor, all the different things that have been studied include um, reading or writing humorous excerpts, but also even just laughter yoga. Has anyone heard of laughter yoga? So yeah, so actually just going through the physical motion of laughing, uh, it, it releases hormones and, and causes physiologic changes that are for the good. And then what about humor and mental health? We have some similar studies that show benefits. Um, the biggest meta-analysis was in 2019, kind of bringing some studies together. Um, depression significantly decreased. Anxiety also decreased with laughter-inducing therapy. And stress levels decreased as a result of, uh, they measured both uh, subjective stress on a scale and then also cortisol levels in the blood. And so laughter may have, again, uh, physiologic therapy uh, with mental health. Since I am a, in a teaching role, I work at an academic medical center, and so I'm constantly in the role of teaching students and residents, and I'm actually a course director in, in the second year uh, hematology, gastroenterology course, and when I meet with my faculty, I often highlight this. So humor and laughter actually promote learning and retention. They, it reduces stress, kind of you know, eases the tension between like student and, and teacher, sustains attention, memory, and recall. Um, and that there are studies to support doing this. The older study from Ziv and colleagues in 1981, it is an older study, but it's really in interesting to me. Uh, a statistics course, now that's pretty dry. That's pretty boring. I I'm trying to figure out how did they introduce humor into a statistics course? Even that is really impressive. Um, and the students were ma randomized to a humor group and a non-humor group. And the students in the humor group outperformed the students on the final exam by 10%. And he went ahead and replicated these results with different students, different subject matter, different teacher. So that's really fascinating to me. And I would argue that when you're in the patient mode, you're sort of in a student mode as well. There's so much to learn. Even me as a primary care physician, I hadn't heard of some of these you know, drugs and treatment regimens in, in the breast cancer world. So you're in the student mode, right? And so having, having your uh, physician or your care team talking to you and teaching you essentially about your diagnosis and what's happening next. Using humor may actually help enhance that retention. So I've been talking at you for a little while. I'd like you to uh, participate in an interactive exercise, if you will. I feel like we have a lot of creative people in the room by that show of hands. Maybe you can uh, work together at your tables, turn to your neighbor and ask them, um, if you are a writer, what challenges do you find, uh, what do you face when finding time or creative energy to write and what's worked for you? Or have you found humor to be useful? Were there people as a part of your cancer journey who could use humor effectively? Or number three, tell us about another coping mechanism that worked well for you along your journey. So I'm going to give you some time to talk at your tables and share a little bit because I think that's so important. Well, thank you, everyone. Maybe we can reconvene as a larger group now. But I recognize a, a huge value of this conference is, is getting to connect with other survivors. So I thought it would be great to have a little breakout session uh, to allow you to do that. The, the last section of my talk, I'm going to focus on lessons learned while I was becoming a patient and how I began to apply them to my own clinical practice as well. And some of the highlights include the importance of choosing the right team, the impact of primary care and continuity of care, doctor-patient communication, as of course, levering technology to benefit patient care, and just acknowledging the fact that becoming a patient is difficult, even for a medically savvy person. And the power of sharing your story, which uh, all of us have alluded to a bit already um, at, at this conference. 
So in the very beginning, whoops, picking the right team. So uh, obviously, um, the uh, it's always a, important to choose wisely. Uh, Mike gave the example of your wife calling around for recommendations, and David Rothenberger's name kept coming up, right? Um, so I actually went outside my insurance network, and I paid a little bit more out of network to see my own colleagues at the university. And at first, I thought, oh, maybe this will be awkward. I mean, I know them from a lot of different interactions. But my radiologist who performed my biopsy, who was also a colon cancer survivor herself, pointed out that me being right there on campus for labs, appointments, scans, and everything would save me time and energy that I could use elsewhere. And that turned out to be really sage and astute advice. And I said, I also, when I went online to look at bios, you know, everyone, most, most physicians are asked to write some sort of bio or their philosophy of care. Um, I found it helpful to read those bios, but also read their publications. So things that they had published, not just in the medical literature, but in the lay press as well, because it gives you a good sense of their practice style and their uh, approach to patient care. And funny that those top docs lists, you know, they do actually kind of mean something. So you might have seen lists in Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine or Minnesota Monthly on the top docs. And that list gets criticized because they, some people say, well, it's not outcomes-based. They don't measure patient outcomes, but it's a peer nomination process. And physicians who have been in practice for a while, they tend to know who is good at what they do and who they want to refer to. And so that there is some value in that uh, process. And I, every time I look at that list, I'm like, yeah, I'd, those are the people I'd send my family to. So there's some validity to that. And interestingly enough, um, primary care, continuity of care. At age 44, I didn't really have a primary MD because I had just kind of gone through my childbearing years. And then I would go in for a physical like every three to four or five years and I'd see somebody different every time. And so that kind of uh, posed a problem, right? When your own health issue arises, when the unexpected happens. It would have been nice, you know, when I needed referrals, when I needed a quick pre-op uh, or even just some advice and opinions on how to proceed next. It would have been much better to have an established relationship with a primary care provider. And now I've uh, gone ahead and done that, obviously. Um, the other thing to know is uh, study after study shows us that continuity of care is not just a warm, fuzzy concept. It improves health outcomes, whether you're looking at rates of cancer screening or diabetic numbers such as A1C, cholesterol, all sorts of health outcomes are benefited by the same patient seeing the same provider over time. And so that's a, a very real take home point. So the importance of doctor patient communication. So it's so interesting being on the other side of the, the stethoscope. I first, that was probably the first time I became really keenly aware of how much the EMR can interfere with doctor patient communication and that computer in the room, right? Uh, my very best experiences, honestly, were when the physician didn't log into the computer at all, except for maybe at the very end, uh, maintained a lot of eye contact, and would write things down. Uh, the surgeon that I saw is famous for his yellow legal notepad, and he just writes, jots down little notes and diagrams and makes columns on this yellow legal notepad, and then just tears it off and gives it to the patient at the end of the visit. So I held on to that paper. I mean, I thought that was way more valuable than what they call the after visit summary. Uh, and as you pointed out, we only remember about half of what we're told verbally during a doctor's appointment. So you're only gonna recall um, half of what was discussed unless you're given some things in writing. So that's very important. So levering technology. Um, it's funny how I, I, I wrote about technology even before the pandemic and the ushering in a virtual care, but the ability to contact your team after hours, you know, calling a clinic on a Saturday is like a nightmare, you know, it, it may, maybe it still is, uh, but just having more alternative modes of communication. I, I appreciate now that we have things like my chart messages. I appreciate that um, most of my physicians gave me their email address. So if something broke down uh, or in their cell phone number, if something broke down during the normal modes of communication that I could get a hold of somebody. And levering te leveraging technology from my end of things as a physician is also meant to improve efficiency, 
uh, and access to care, as well as reducing pointless busy work. So therefore, it does help mitigate burnout, right? If, you're, if there's things that can happen automatically, standing orders and things that can happen through the EMR uh, for routine screening tests, that's just one example. Uh, it makes our lives easier, and then we can focus more on the patient. I want to take a little sidebar. If you see on the bottom there, I recently wrote a blog post about virtual care in jeopardy. So I'm going to take a minute to explain this. The um, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services has proposed ending reimbursement for virtual care at the end of 2024. And it's tied to the expiration of the public health emergency, which I think is a terrible idea. And it's also really the two are not related, it's a non sequitur. So we have found that virtual care works great for so many appointments. So when I want to connect with my patient who's recently been started on a hypertension medication and they have a home blood pressure cuff, we can discuss the readings uh, on a video visit. It's also um, reduces barriers to access to care. So not every patient can take a half a day off of work. Not every patient has ease of transportation and just getting to the clinic can be a barrier. Um, and so we're arguing as both um, I just, I'm putting it out there so that we can advocate for keeping virtual care a permanent part of healthcare despite the ending of the pandemic. So if you want to read more about that, um, I did write a post on my blog. Um, and I just urge everybody to contact their, their professional organizations, their local leadership, local government, maybe the insurance companies as well, because although Center for Medicare and Medicaid in theory only affects Medicare and Medicaid recipients, typically private insurance carriers follow suit. So I think ending virtual care would be a terrible idea and, and would be a real detriment to uh, things that we learned on the positive side uh, during the pandemic. So public service announcement, I couldn't resist putting that in there because you know there's a, there's a point in that uh, breakout session that you're gonna talk about time toxicity, right? A virtual visit can save time and expedite care in all sorts of ways. And so I would hate to see that end. So as I mentioned earlier, becoming a patient is difficult, right? I've, I've learned that in my own practice, uh, it's the little things uh, and anything that we can do to make the patient care experience just a tiny bit better, I would embrace wholeheartedly. Sometimes it's emotional, like aspects of showing empathy, the, you know, the touch on the shoulder and things like that, eye contact. Other times it's more technical. It's picking up the phone and calling the specialist that I would like my uh, patient to see sooner rather than later, or even better showing up in person. Um, I think the, uh, a lot of the team on the second floor breast center has gotten used to me just popping in from time to time with a clinical question on, on a patient that I've had. Um, so doing little things to expedite patient care, which I appreciated even more after my own experience. And then the power of sharing your story. So one of the side benefits, I guess, of seeking care in your own system is I started to get a lot of internal referrals from my oncology team, patients that were recently diagnosed with breast cancer, for example, and didn't have a primary care doctor, they would send them to me. And that was such a good fit. I mean, what a synergism between what I knew from my own patient experience and how I could help them navigate um, things going forward and knowing a little bit about each of the treatment options that they would uh, potentially be uh, going through. So it's a great synergy and it's a great working relationship. Um, but as that happened, I began to wonder, <clears throat> should I open up to my patients about my own diagnosis or is that too much? Is that kind of strange? Um, I found that, and I wrote a little piece about it, I found that opening up just a bit um, doesn't have to be a lot of information, made a huge difference in terms of empathy, anxiety, the stress level. Um, each patient would say, thank you for telling me that. Now I have so much more, uh, I'm, my mind is at ease now that I have someone else to, to help guide me through this. For example, um, I might say, I might say, you know, I know what you're going through. I'm a breast cancer survivor too, without having to divulge all the details. Or I'll just say, um, I, I, I know what you're going through and I know a little bit about this field because I've been there myself. And then they, it's just a, sort of a nod. It's a great way of showing empathy. And quite honestly, it's the opposite of what we were taught in medical school. I'll be honest with you. We were taught that doctors shouldn't reveal too much personal information about themselves to their patients because it might kind of cloud the, the doctor relationship, doctor-patient relationship in some way. But I've actually found the opposite to be true. So that's just my opinion. And, and um, I, I'm kind of, um, I've been using that as a technique, if you will, in my patient-centered interviewing, and it seems to work well. Now, there is a saying 
And forgive me if it's an outdated term. There's this saying called happy wife, happy life when it comes to a marital relationship. I would propose that the same phrase applies to the doctor-patient relationship. And what I mean by that is there are several studies that show that uh, physician satisfaction and patient satisfaction are tightly correlated. Um, so when a doctor is frustrated, um, they're also, uh, there's also a diminished patient satisfaction, right? So increased burnout leads to increased patient dissatisfaction. So having this in mind, um, anything that enhances the doctor-patient relationship makes me and almost any other provider really kind of reinforces that joy in medicine because it's all about making connections, right? So it's been quite a journey for me from doctor to patient and back. Um, I'm seven years out from my diagnosis. I've had no evidence of recurrence. I continue to take tamoxifen. Why not? You know, I'll just keep on it. <laughs> I'm tolerating it well. Um, and so I have, a, I have a yearly 3D mammogram on the left side every June, uh, which all have been negative, thankfully. But my experiences really do continue to shape my practice style and my approach, not just to patient care, but to teaching students and residents um, to this day, and hopefully for the better. So that's the end of my presentation. And I would open it up to questions, comments, um, anything from the audience, from the group. And then also you, there's some bookmarks and business cards on the tables. Feel free to take those if you want to take one with you today. But thank you for the invite and the opportunity to speak. Questions? I'm ending a little early and if there wants to be any discussion. Oh, yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to comment. Is this on? I just wanted to comment that I couldn't agree with you more. I'm also a, a breast cancer survivor, and I would have loved to know that my doctor had gone through it. And the, mm. because there's it's it's a different experience, as you know. Mm -hmm. And to, in if you, I think you understand it differently if you've been through it as opposed to a, uh, just a, from a doctor's perspective. So I think that's wonderful. Well, thank you. I, I tend to agree. I think it's um, it's reassuring. I think that's the best thing. It's reassuring to the patient that uh, there's some working knowledge there in the background. Any other questions? Feedback there in the back? Um, hi, my daughter and I are both breast cancer survivors. And we both had caring bridge pages. Mm. So I'm guessing most people here probably have too, but we both we both have a sense of humor about how we wrote about our experiences. And she wrote on mine when I was going through it. I'd never wrote on hers, but I think that's just a really good way of supporting. And then the comments we got back from a lot of people are that, you know, what a positive attitude, what a good outlook, and they've enjoyed the stories. It was a way of sharing that information and having a sense of humor about it too. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying to find a way now to download that and print it out so that it becomes kind of a journal for our families. Sure, so. great, good for you. One of my patients who's also a breast cancer survivor, she's got a, a witty, very dry, witty sense of humor. And she told me about that. She literally hosted a, a bra burning party like after her surgery. And I'm, I'm envisioning this, I'm in the office, I'm envisioning like, flames going up and underwires popping. And I was like, wow, you know, and I was just like, oh, and she said that she wrote some sort of blog post about that and it got all kinds of positive feedback. So good for you. Hi, um, I'm a Hodgkin's and breast cancer survivor. Um, I was just curious about those five steps. Sure. You kept mentioning them. Sure, I would be happy to go through them. And now they're like embroiled on my brain, right? So I have them right here. So there's five steps. It's fire a warning shot, uh, find out what they know, share information, respond to the emotions, and create a follow-through plan. So fire a warning shot for me was like this. My, my kids are 8 and 11. So um, mom's got some news, and it might not be um, great to hear, but I want to talk to you about something. So fire a warning shot. Number two, find out what they know. I said, what do you know about cancer? And my 8-year-old was like, cancer is when cells like take over your body and destroy everything and stuff. And I'm like, that's pretty good, <laughs> you know, that's pretty spot on. And then I said, well, you know, I have some news that my, my doctors found a lump and they did a biopsy and it's positive for cancer. And so, you know, you kind of have to put it out there. And then we shared information. So, um, you know, my daughter started crying and shut down immediately. And my son was more analytical and he's like, well, can you just cut it out? Well, yes, that is one approach. Um, can it ever come back? And I go, well, that's pretty informed for a child to ask about recurrence rates, right? 
and I said, well, I'm going to have surgery to remove it, medication to control it, and I have a great team of doctors. And then I you know, planned the follow through as the fifth step. So I said, we're going to meet again after my next appointment, and I'm going to talk to you more about the treatment plan. So it's five steps. It's a medical model, but it works quite well for family members and even young children, um, which was a surprise to me. But so it was a handy part of my medical training that I did not anticipate to use that way. But um, it definitely helped them process it, definitely. Hi, Hello. I am a breast cancer survivor for 17 years. And Congrats. And I just want to say that how much I appreciate Dr. Thompson, who is my primary care physician. And she's not only shows empathy, but she's an excellent interpersonal communicator. She's oh, thank you. That's good. sweet. <laughs> I, that she's not a plant in, in, in the audience. <laughs> but you know, it is it's rewarding for me to take care of breast cancer survivors. It's a really good synergy for me as well. Okay, we just had one online comment. Somebody oh. said that she wishes that humor was actually prescribed along with medication. Good. I like that approach. A prescription for humor. You had a great discussion. I personally have not. I, I think, you know, I'm thinking about my primary care provider. She seems pretty healthy, young kids, all that. Um, so I've not in, been in that situation. I have had a patient of mine who's also a, a, a neurologist um, who has shared her some of her um, health history with her patients. Um, but she's also a cancer survivor as well now. Uh, but I don't know of many. Anyone in the room, raise your hand if you've had that convo conversation. Okay, good. Good. I, th I think it's a valid approach. I mean, everyone's different. You know, everyone has their own comfort level. Maybe some older physicians would are, are trained, you know, like I said, we're, we're kind of trained to have um, more privacy, if you will. But I think that's evolving and changing. And so I think that's a, a change for the better. Yes. Uh, sure. So, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, one of my favorite comments in the, uh, you know, Amazon has like book reviews. One person said, I had no idea that a book about cancer could be funny. And to me, that was like the highest compliment, you know. Uh, and so, yeah, I agree with you there. Sometimes it's surprising um, uh, that you would want to make light of something. But um, many of my physician colleagues, I'm thinking like Stuart Bloom in oncology, he's like the king of using humor. So um, it, it is a worthwhile approach. Yes. Yes, I'm an old nurse, and I just want to say, 19 years of prostate cancer behind me. Good. And Good many for you. Many applications that are not here today that I wish were here. Mm. Well, thank you. I think we're about at time. Um, we're going to have a little break before the next breakout session, right? Is that what's coming up next? All right. Thank you again. Dr. Thompson, that was amazing. Um, and Mike, uh, I want to thank both equally. I think we, considering I'm hearing there's so many people who have been affected, are being affected, or know someone who is and have been affected by cancer, um, we all had a moment of self-reflection within the stories that have been communicated. And I know I have. Um, uh, your son reminds me of me when I was going through that, because those are the kinds of questions I asked about myself. Um, and I feel a lot of power within you communicating um, how you actively are trying to take your experience from both sides of the coin to help further um, research and development and humor in our lives that's necessary. Um, I really appreciate that. So awesome. One more round of applause, please, for both of them.